Well, greetings. Greetings from my family in Pennsylvania. My wife, Katie, might be watching uh, as she corrals my three children, Avery, Leah, and Camden. Uh, so greetings from them. I was struck uh, this morning as we were worshiping that my great-grandfather, who I never met, uh, used to ride around on a donkey in his state, planting churches and speaking at revivals. And my great-grandfather would have loved to be here with all of you. Uh, and, and I can't wait to meet him in heaven. Uh, I was just struck and overwhelmed by gratitude to the faithfulness of God to our family. Uh, my, my father, Dennis, has been a pastor for about 40 years. And my mother, Valerie, has never met a stranger. And uh, she's befriended everyone she's met. And I have two sisters, and I just loved growing up in a Christian family. And by God's providence and the power of the Holy Spirit and my parents' faithful obedience, my two sisters and I love the Lord and love our neighbors. I, I never will forget that growing up, my father used to say, and my mom too, Ryan, we are your family here on earth, but we know that you belong to God. Um, at, from childhood all the way through university, I, I was confident that God wanted me to use any skill I had to address public policy issues facing um, my neighbors in the United States. I never imagined uh, going overseas. I, I didn't care to take those classes in university. I never thought about that, and neither did my parents. But in 2004, God called me to go to Zimbabwe, and I was surprised by that, as were my parents, but we all belong to God. And so for the next 14 years, I found myself as a missionary traveling back and forth between the United States and Zimbabwe, and, and uh, it was amazing. On my second trip to Zimbabwe, I remember um, holding the hand of a dying woman, I had been sent there by my church to figure out how we could solve the orphan care crisis in Zimbabwe and, and how naive I was to think that I could do that. But I, but I remember holding this woman's hand as she was watching her two children watch her die. And as a 24-year-old white kid from the suburbs of Boston in Massachusetts, I was like, what do I know about this? But God in his mercy said, look around. And I, and I saw that I, it wasn't for me to believe even for a second that I was the first pe person to care about these children. And that there were pastors in Zimbabwe and every community that I had been in who loved these children and were looking after widows and orphans. But the thing is that their voices hadn't been heard yet. I never heard that there was a growing church thriving in Africa. I never heard that before. And so God led me after that trip to start a ministry called Forgotten Voices, a ministry that quietly equips local churches in Southern Africa to meet the physical and spiritual needs of children orphaned by AIDS. Churches that were working in places where there's, they're the only plan A. The local church is the only plan A, and there is no plan B. Through that work, a few years ago, I found myself in Malawi, and I think that there's a picture of this church that we have uh, that, that I was with. And in this, in this place, it's a place called Chikwawa, Malawi. It's in southern Malawi. Anybody from Malawi here? Yeah, we got a couple. Okay. The quiet people. Uh, but this, this place, Chikwawa, Malawi, and I'd heard about this church. This church has two U.S. dollars a week in tithes and offerings, yet we're helping dozens of children who have been orphaned by AIDS in their community. And I'd heard about their three-hour prayer vigils that they'd have after every Sunday service and praying about how God would help them to be wise, to be good stewards of this $2. And I'd heard about their passion and their faithfulness to use their money well before our king, and I wanted to go and see it for myself. This, this church in Chikwawa, Malawi, had been through a lot. There had been a massive flooding the year before I had arrived, and the year I came, there was a massive flood, a drought and then a flood. These people had been through a lot, but this church believed that God's word was true. This church believed that God was calling them too to look after widows and orphans. And I wanted to go and see what was happening. And so myself, my father had been a pastor for 40 years from the United States. He came with me. Remy uh, Hamapande from Zambia. He's with us here at the forum. And, and another guy, a colleague of mine, Stephen in Malawi. We all went there. And, this, and if you look at this picture, the folks on the left are from this church. And they shared powerfully about how they were using their $2 a week. But then as they finished, they said, but Ryan, 
the, the real need is over there, this local community, and we want to serve them too. And join us in praying that we can serve them too. And so they had invited, over a day-long time of just listening, they invited this other church. And this other church from that far-off place is in the middle in this picture. And these people were having a dollar a week, a dollar, one U.S. dollar a week in tithes and offerings. And they too were praying for two, three hours after their church service about what God would have them do to look after widows and orphans in their community. But they said, but, but Ryan, there's this place just over there that we also want to reach. And it's the people on the right in their community that are struggling far more. And these people have 50 cents a week in tithes and offerings. And they were saying, Ryan, there's these people over there too that we want to meet. And as we left, after a day of listening to these pastors and these church leaders share about their heart for widows and orphans, I remember my father looked to the heavens and he said, don't these people know that they are the poor? Friends, the thing that I learned from that time, that day, something that I want to impress upon you all, that there's no place on earth where God's word stops being true. Like there's no economic cutoff. Like if you make this much and below, you do not have to obey God. You're off the hook. Or if you make this much and above, you don't need the Lord until you need him. There's no place on earth where God's word stops being true. But God in his mercy has also taught me through that, that there's nowhere on earth where God's word stops being true. But God does not ask us to be God. He asks us to be faithful. He doesn't ask us to do everything. He asks us to be faithful, to use the things that he has given us, come what may. But the other thing I learned from that church is that even before we can even begin an honest conversation about how to intervene well, we have to understand what is the condition of our heart, about why we're doing any of this. These churches in Malawi and in other places that have been around Southern Africa have been my guide and my shepherd to understand what it means to love well. And, and the three words I want to give you tonight that I want you to think about in the condition of your heart are purpose, poise, and joy. Purpose, poise, and joy. What do I mean by those words? Purpose. I want us to look at purpose. Why are we doing any of this? This church in Malawi shows us that our purpose is not, it certainly involved orphan care and caring for vulnerable children, and I'm for all of those things. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't, right? We are all for helping widows and orphans, but that's not our primary purpose. Our purpose, our primary purpose is to spend our lives on the gospel. To spend our lives on the gospel knowing that the Lord, our Jesus Christ, is the author and perfecter of our faith, and it is Him we put our trust. And we can know that His word is true. Because if we try to make orphan care and vulnerable care our, our highest order, our highest purpose for how we intervene well, we will fail. And even if we have whispers of success, they will not last. Because God does not ask us to be God. He asks us to be faithful. That's why a church in Malawi with $2 or $1, 50 cents a week, can believe that God can do the impossible through them. They know that they are not God. They know that they depend on him, and it is in him they put their trust. That is their purpose, to spend their lives on the gospel. So purpose, and then poise. Poise is really important. Poise is to be stable, to be rooted, to be confident. And what can we be confident? We can be confident and poised, knowing that God's word is true. We can be confident knowing that Genesis 28, 15 and Joshua 1, 9 is true, that we can be strong and courageous knowing that the Lord will be with us and watching over us wherever we go. So we can have purpose and poise and joy. Joy comes when we have our purpose and our poise. And I don't mean like just walking around smiling all the time that everything's okay, because it's not. Right? I know that this word... This work that we all do is hard. I have buried far more children than I'd like to admit. Hundreds of children. Hundreds of children. Hundreds of children. But we can have joy knowing that the word of God is true. 
and he is the author and perfecter of our faith, and he who has begun a mighty work in us will bring it to completion. He has been at work before us, after us, through us, despite us, around us, always, for all time, everywhere, for all people, now and forevermore. And he is seeking our good. We can have joy knowing that we can look for him and the story he is writing in us. We can know that we can have joy knowing that God has been at work before us and after us. We can have joy knowing that even when we make mistakes, we can go to bed at night trusting that his mercy and grace is new each morning. And we can try again tomorrow. So purpose, poise, and joy. For 14 years, I've had a front row seat of watching God do the impossible through churches in Southern Africa. It's been the great honor of my life, besides being married to my awesome wife. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I became a pastor in the United States. I left the ministry of Forgotten Voices, and God, God called me, um, the God who called me to go to Africa, called me to come back home and become a pastor and what's amazing to me is that um, God had certainly called me to be a pastor, and that's why I am one. But he has prepared me to be a pastor because I had a front row seat to watch God do the impossible through the faithfulness of pastors who shepherded their people. And what's been amazing to me is I've stepped into this role as a minister in the United States. People often say to me in my congregation and other churches nearby, they say, Ryan, there's not enough time and there's not enough money. And I say, brother, sister... That's true, but let me tell you about the churches of Chikwawa, Malawi. The right question isn't whether we have enough. We don't have enough. The right question, friends, for all of us, when we think about how to intervene well, is are we willing to give God our everything? And in doing so, we seek his glory because our purpose, our purpose is to spend our lives on the gospel. So with that said, we still need to intervene well. And my job at the church is actually, um, surprisingly, it's amazing how God works. I'm now leading a foster care initiative in our church. Uh, in the United States, we have about 400,000 children in foster care. And in my area, the, 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 the number of children in foster care has been skyrocketing in our area, mostly due to drug abuse. And so God had prepared me even before I knew that I would need this preparation about what it means to be faithful and caring for children for the long run. And at Forgotten Voices, there's three principles of how to intervene well that I would love um, for you all to hear about just briefly. Because as we look at our purpose, our poise, and our joy, it's still important that we, that we do things with excellence. We intervene well with excellence because our work is a proclamation of the gospel. So what I want to do is I want to invite um, Shelton Taguma to come on the stage. Shelton is the new leader of Forgotten Voices. And I want him to share with you three principles of how to intervene well. Thanks, Shelton. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Intervening well. As an organization, we are a learning organization. Over the last 14 years, as he has mentioned, we have had the experience of uh, really learning and listening to local voices. One of the privileges we have is we're working in three countries, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi. And we have had the opportunity of partnering with over 150 churches in these areas. And our posture has always been listening to the local voices, not always coming and telling them what to do. So intervening well looks different in different contexts. But here are the three principles that we have learned, and these are the principles that are guiding how we are moving forward as an organization. First, we are saying we need to empower the local church because the local church is not going anywhere. We like it or not, they're not going anywhere. Even if our buildings are old, even if uh, we're meeting under the tree, we are not going anywhere. Yeah, This is the bride of Christ, and we are meant to equip the bride of Christ. If we empower the local churches, we know that uh, they will be there and they will meet the needs of their own people. So our role is that intervening well is empowering the entity that is already existing. 
not coming with all these new things because sometimes trends come and go. But sometimes finding the right way to actually walk and partner alongside people takes time. The second principle is the custom, custom plans. Allowing the local church to customize how they respond in their community. Sometimes some of our programs come with a very specific agenda that ends up actually you know, changing the dynamic of uh, the ecosystem of the place. And that really makes it hard for the local church to remain and function in the communities that already exist in. The third and the last uh, principle that we use is sustainable impact. From the beginning, what we want to do is that we don't want to partner with the local church forever. We want to equip the local church to be sustainable. Our partnerships run for a certain time, and the idea is that uh, the church has already got its own agency. They have their own resources, but what they lack sometimes is very simple things like capacity building. Sometimes it's resources. Sometimes it's just uh, being moved or being kind of, uh, what's the word, sensitized over certain issues. But when they have that, we have seen the church in Africa grow and rise up and do amazing things for the word of God. So we, uh, these are the principles that we, we are using, uh, and uh, these could be adapted in different contexts. And we will invite you, as you intervene in your different locations, let's think about how do we intervene well. Are our interventions at the same time only meeting the needs now, or are they there to stay even after we are gone? Thank you. Thank you. I'm so thankful to God. Uh, you know, when, when, I mean, Shelton's life is such a great example of what it means uh, and his story of what God has taken him from Zimbabwe and then other places around Central America, Central Africa, South, Southern Africa, Nicaragua, to the United States, and now leading Forgotten Voices is such a testimony uh, to um, God's goodness. And um, I just want to end with, with this. This idea of intervening well is so hard and so wide, and there's so many things that you could do. And, and there can almost be a stifling paralysis that can come about because people are so afraid to do the wrong thing that what happens is they end up doing nothing, right? Uh, and I've been at this for a long time, and I meet people who read these books, and they come to these conferences, and they're afraid to do the wrong thing. So a concept that's been really helpful to me that I want to leave you with this is this. The thing that God's teaching me is that we should strive to be a great sentence— just one great sentence in the middle of an exceptional book that God is writing. You know, sentences to be part of a great story need other sentences, right? So be a great sentence. Be the best you can be, but know that God is writing sentences in other people. He's been writing sentences before you, and he'll be doing it after you. So be an exceptional sentence. Be a great sentence. Just one sentence. You'll start looking for how you can be used, and your sentence can be used to highlight the work of others. And your sentence will only be remembered in the story if it's connected to other sentences, right? And then we think about how sentences become paragraphs, and paragraphs become chapters, and chapters become books. It's so much more freeing that we can strive to be a great sentence, just one. And if we all look for how we can strive to be a great sentence in the middle of an exceptional book, I think it frees us to be who God called us to be. But know that it's not our work. The story is about him, not us. And so friends, just know that God doesn't want you to be exhausted and shriveled up and tired and living on the margins. He wants you to move with purpose, poise, and joy with the condition of your heart, roaring that your God is your King and Lord over everything. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, and He is the one who will bring about this to completion. And in that, we can rest, and in that, we can put our hope and our trust so that all who see and meet us see and meet the story that God is writing. Our God is not shrinking. He is roaring. And he is writing a mighty story through us. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Thanks for being here.